Because you got nothing. You got nothing in court. You don't got the bookkeeper. You got nothing. Nothing. And if you were a man, you would have done it now. You don't got a thing, you punk. It's Sunday morning on CBS. And here again is Charles Osgood. That 1987 film, The Untouchables, cast Robert De Niro as the Chicago mobster Al Capone, whose injuries from youthful brawling earned him the nickname Scarface. The recent arrest of Boston gangster James Whitey Bulger after 16 years on the lam got us to thinking about that earlier hoodlum and the long shadow he still manages to cast. Dean Reynolds went in search of the real Capone. Nine decades ago, Americans needed a break. World War I had just ended. And just when people wanted nothing more than to pack up all their cares and woes and maybe have a stiff drink or three, Prohibition arrived in 1920 like a sobering slap across the face. Mash meant for market as bootleg booze is poured into the mud. There was, however, another arrival that year in Chicago one that would come to define prohibition. It involved a 20-year-old named Alphonse Gabriel Capone, AKA Scarface, a tough kid from Brooklyn who saw clarity in the chaos and opportunity in the Windy City. They've eliminated almost every trace of Capone that you could find. Jonathan Eig is the author of a book called Get Capone. Nobody really liked prohibition, and certainly in Chicago, Plenty of people were still drinking. This was, this was a, one of the wettest cities in the, in the country throughout Prohibition. Corrupt as it was, Chicago was a very good place for a savvy hood to provide what were called the lighter pleasures. When Prohibition came along, it was incredibly tempting, if you were working a menial job, to get into this line and suddenly make more money than you ever dreamed possible, if you were willing to put up with the risks, of course. Capone was more than willing muscling his rivals to the side, and by the mid-20s, gaining the lion's share of Chicago's graft, the bootlegging, bookmaking, and brothels. He was an opportunist, do you know what I mean? He saw the moment, and he took it, and he grasped it with both hands. What are you doing here? I'm a pipe band. What else? <laughs> British actor Stephen Graham plays a young Capone in the hit HBO series, Boardwalk Empire. To be 27 years of age and own Chicago and run that whole empire, that's one hell of a, that's one hell of a mind and, and one hell of a desire, do you know what I mean, and a passion to, to achieve that. Capone achieved all of it with a splash of style, the best clothes, the biggest cars, and more. Capone talked to the media and, and really welcomed the spotlight so that people heard more about him. But away from the spotlight... If you had a, a butcher shop and you weren't paying your contribution to the local protection association, the first thing is you'd get a broken window. The next thing is you might get a pineapple, a homemade bomb, hand grenade equivalent, maybe a baseball bat to the head, to the knee, and then finally, you know, if, if you still didn't get the message, somebody might get killed. Chicago, Chicago, that toddling town. While that sort of thing went on, Chicago, Capone Chicago, would likely be out on the town. The Green Mill Cocktail Lounge was a favorite haunt, and this was his favorite table. I'm guessing he didn't have to pay for his own drinks, uh, but he would certainly uh, consume them in a place like this. All right, come on through here. Owner Dave Gemelo tends bar nowadays at the Green Mill, right above a subterranean escape route used by gangsters. If you went this way, you're under the street, and then it was boarded up. Then you go down this way, and there's a whole other set of tunnels. But So this was pretty elaborate. Yeah. I mean, they were serious about escaping. Well, wouldn't you be? The house has changed very little over the years. Capone's favorite spot, though, was this quiet home on a quiet south side street that he shared with his wife and son. This was really the Capone homestead uh, throughout the, most of the century. This is a picture of my Uncle Al and me, and I've got his straw hat on. Deirdre Capone is Al Capone's grandniece. She remembers this house on Prairie Avenue and the family that lived there. It was just a fun Italian family with food that, I mean, we'd sit down four hours later, we were still eating food. 
and she recalls her uncle as definitely the man in charge. When he came into a room, it was like lightning went off. And, and he loved that. He loved to be the center of attention. He loved to be the big shot. Eventually, though, the limelight he coveted turned against him. You know, every time something happened in Chicago, he felt like he was going to be blamed for it. So when several members of rival gangster Bugs Moran's outfit were gunned down against a garage wall in February of 1929, suspicion immediately centered on Capone. And it still does. I, I think it's likely that Capone had something to do with this uh, attack. John Russick is curator of the Chicago History Museum. It was large scale uh, attack, lots of people dead. Now, the wall was where? The north wall would have run right about here somewhere. So but Jonathan Eig says because Moran wasn't among the dead, he doesn't think Capone was involved. The massacre does not fit Capone's M.O. at all. He'd eliminated many of his rivals before, and he did it in a certain way, and it was very efficient and very effective, and he almost never missed. It became known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Shooters in police uniforms lined seven people up against the wall and methodically executed them in a hail of bullets from Thompson submachine guns or Tommy guns. A couple of priceless pieces of history here. And coincidentally, two of the guns used that day were eventually recovered in St. Joseph, Michigan, a place where Capone and his pals would vacation and where Mike Klein is now a deputy sheriff. St. Valentine's Day massacre happened at 2122 North Clark Street, Chicago, February 14, 1929. And this machine gun that you're about to hold was used there. Dean, you want to shoot a Thompson submachine gun? Empty. Wow. Okay. I think you hit something. <laughs> Did I? Oh, you're one of those kinds of shooters, huh? <laughs> He's singing soprano now. Wow. <laughs> Don't mess with me. <laughs> the St. Valentine's Day Massacre brought worldwide notoriety to Chicago's violent streets and Capone. You can go to almost any country outside the United States and say Chicago and people start going, Al Capone to you. Uh, he's sort of an enigma in some sense. He was uh, not to be stopped. The big boy himself. But soon he was stopped by the feds and, as television would have many believe, Elliot Ness, the real-life prohibition agent cast as Capone's nemesis. There we are. I think over the years, his role has been expanded to be seen as the primary crime fighter who brought down Capone, when in fact, it was much more of a legal machinery that brought down Capone. And not for gangland killings or violating prohibition, but on tax evasion charges. Here he comes. That's Al wearing the big white hat. I think it was a miscarriage of justice in many ways. Capone was a man who deserved to be punished and deserved to go to jail, but he probably did not deserve to go to jail for as long as he did on these particular charges. He served eight years, four of them in Alcatraz, was diagnosed with syphilis behind bars, and returned to Chicago an enfeebled man who died in 1947. He had just turned 48. But that was hardly the end of this story. Al Capone remains a legendary figure in American history. Everybody knows the most famous gangster from the South Side, right here in Chicago, huh? Al Capone, yeah, yeah. Especially in the Windy City. It's Chicago's persona and also even the nation. I think that uh, there's something in his, his attitude and his determination, his success, that we're sort of attracted to. Just as long as we don't come too close.